So now let's talk about the depends of rate on concentration. Uh, so far, we've been talking about ways to affect rate, what rate is. So now let's look at it from an actual technical standpoint. Reactions are dependent on their reactants. Now they have different types of dependences. Not all reactions are directly affected by every substance that's in the chemical reaction. Up until now, we basically assumed that, okay, well, if I put in a lot of this and a lot of that, well, the reaction's going to go a lot. And that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes when we put in a lot of A, but only a little bit of B, the reaction isn't affected at all, despite the fact that, remember, that we're still basing everything on numbers of collisions, the frequency of the collisions. So what happens is when two substances mix inside of a chemical reaction, you can actually write out a, what's called a rate law. This guy here is what is called your rate law. And a rate law governs at what rate a chemical reaction takes place, how dependent the speed of the reaction is on the individual components of the chemical reaction. Now notice that the rate law is only dependent on reactants. Since a product is not present there when you first start, it cannot affect an overall reaction. Okay, so how much product there, no, no effect on the speed. So K in this rate law is what is called a rate constant. It's a constant that governs that particular rate. It is dependent, it is constant for a chemical reaction. So regardless of how much of A and how much of B you put in there, it's always going to be exactly the same. But the big problem is it is dependent on temperature. So you'll always notice that somewhere in the problem there'll be a degree Celsius. The degree Celsius doesn't actually factor into the calculations, but it changes the K. So remember what I said on the previous slide, in the previous video, is that temperature affects the chemical reaction because they need a certain amount of energy in order to react. That's that activation energy. Okay, well, if you raise the temperature, it's going to change the rate, so therefore it's going to change your K. The uh, A and B and in the brackets is going to be your instantaneous concentrations of your substances. Remember that brackets mean concentration. Typically molarities in this problem, but it doesn't have to be. It can be mass, it could be moles, it could be any number of different things. But anytime you see the brackets, always know that that means concentrations. And when I say instantaneous, is remember that the, the concentration is constantly changing as the reaction takes place. So we ha just like speed, we have to take an instantaneous value for that concentration. So we basically a snapshot. If we stop it at exactly this point, these are the molarities, these are the moles that are present in the chemical reaction. Uh, M and N are exponents and they're what are called reaction orders. And the only way that you can figure out these reaction orders is through experimental data. For our purposes, they're always going to be whole numbers. However, there is such a thing as a half order reaction which would be inverse. So actually what would happen is it would take down, so as you add stuff it would actually reduce the rate. So almost like an inhibitor to a chemical reaction. So the only way you can figure these out is through experimental data. You actually have to have numbers and a chemical reaction taking place to be able to figure all of this out. Now there are a couple of different reaction orders that we are going to be looking at or that you can look at. Uh, there are things that are called zero order reactions where the reaction doesn't depend at all on that substance. So I put in A and B, but B doesn't affect it at all, so it's what's called a zero order reaction. But really what I want to do is I want to focus on two specific types of orders. I want to talk about first order and second order reactions because they're the most common. First order reactions are situations where the rate only depends on one reactant. So it doesn't matter. I could have 50 reactants in there, but only one of them actually affects the speed of the chemical reaction. Remember, whenever I say the word rate, I'm talking about speed of the, of the chemical reaction. So my speed, how fast the reaction is taking place, is only dependent on this substance. So what this is telling me is um, whatever I do to the concentration will be exactly equal to the rate. Okay, so if I double my concentration, 
I'll double my rate. If I quadruple my concentration, I'll quadruple my rate. Okay, so it's, it's sort of like a one-to-one -one ratio. Whatever my change is here will be my change there. Now, notice I said change. Okay, it's not whatever the value is here. Okay, they're not the same value. So if I have one molar of concentration of A, it doesn't mean I have one as my rate. But if I take my one concentration and double it to two, then my rate will double whatever it was before. Okay, so whatever I do to one will be exactly do to the other. The most common first order reaction is a half life. Okay, a half life is defined as the time it takes for one half of a sample to react or one half of the sample to decompose. Typically, when we talk about half lives, we are talking not about the video game, we are talking about a uh, nuclear reaction. So, something is decomposing. So, I started with one gram, one half life later, I have half of a gram. One half life after that, I have a quarter of a gram. Now, you're asking, wait a second, how did you get a quarter of a gram? Well, what's one half of a half? A half of a half is a fourth. And if I went down from there, it continues. So half of a fourth is an eighth, a half of an eighth is a sixteenth. Now, that's, now, the other thing I want you to make sure that you understand with half-lives is, no matter how many half-lives have gone on, all half-lives are exactly the same length. So the time it takes me, think of it on a timeline. The time it takes me to go from one to a half is exactly the same time it takes me to go to a fourth. This time it takes me to go to an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-second, so on and so forth. So this time x is the exact same time as this all the way through. Every half-life throughout the entire course of that substance, all the way down from whatever it is to time zero, is going to be the exact same length of time. Okay. It's a little weird to think about because we're like, well, wait, there's less of it. Shouldn't it go faster? And it doesn't. Uh, it's the, one of the weird things about half-lives is as it decomposes, the exact same amount is decomposing at the exact same rate because it's directly dependent on that substance. So the change in the concentration is exactly the same change as in the time at, the rate, at it occurs. So think about half-lives on a timeline. It's the easiest way to think about it. You know, if you look at it and you say, okay, well, if one half-life is five months, okay, well, in five months, I'll have half of, half of whatever I had before, and another five months, I'll have another half, I'll have a quarter, and then so on and so forth. Then it doesn't matter how large the sample is. My sample could be one gram, or my sample could be a hundred grams. The half-life is exactly the same. So after one half-life, I'll have half of a gram, or after one half-life, I'll have 50 grams. It doesn't matter. Now, the other type of reaction order is, that I want to talk about is a second-order reaction. There are two main types of second-order reactions. The first one is just like a first-order, where it's only dependent on one substance. Now, you'll notice that my reaction order has changed to two. So that means that it's a second-order reaction. But it's only dependent on this one substance. Again, I could still have A plus B yield C. Okay? I don't have to have only one substance. Um, I could have multiple. Or I could even have um, A decomposing into something like B and C. And that still is going to give me a second order reaction. Both of those chemical reactions can give me second order reactions. Again, if you look at the chemical reaction, it's impossible to tell what's going on. Remember what I said about reaction orders. They only can be determined from experimental data. So looking at a chemical reaction will not tell me which one it is. Or it could be dependent on two substances. Rate equals K A, plus A times B. Now you said, well, wait a second, Mr. Siegel. How is that a second order reaction? Well, it's first order with respect to A, first order with respect to B. One plus one is two. So that's a second order reaction. It's second order overall, is really what I'm saying. Okay? So, in the case of the first one, where my rate is equal to a, a k times a to the second power, if I were to double my concentration of a and it's squared, look what happens to my rate. It goes up by a factor of four. Okay? And that's all because of that reaction order being a two. But in the case of the second one, something slightly different occurs. Because my rate is now dependent on two substances, if I were to double my A, my rate will only double, keeping B the same. Okay? If I were to double my A and my B, both being first order, 
my rate will now go up by a factor of four. So now it's dependent on both substances to go up. Okay? It's in the first one, only one substance. Second one, now multiple substances. Okay, so I can change one and affect the rate. I could also flip flop it and say, okay, well let me hold A constant, but double B. Uh, look at that, the rate only doubles. Okay, so now my rate is dependent on multiple things. So this is where varying my concentration of both substances will actually affect the rate. Think of it very similar to a limiting reagent type of situation, but instead of the reaction stopping because of a limiting reagent, this actually limits the speed at which the reaction occurs. Okay? Uh, it's almost like if you were baking and you're making brownies, if you were to double the number of eggs, the rate at which the brownies cooked in the oven would double. I know it sounds kind of ridiculous. You're like, wait, no, that would just make eggy brownies. But actually, it's in chemistry, it's going to be a little bit weird. I said cooking and chemistry are similar, but not the same. You know, So if I doubled my eggs, my reaction would speed up. So my brownies would cook in half the time. Or if I halved my water, my reaction would, my, my brownies would cook in longer period of time because I decreased the amount of water. So it, it would it's kind of weird. It would be awesome if cooking worked like that. You're like, oh, I'll just throw an extra spoonful of sugar in there, and bam, I've knocked two minutes off my baking time. But unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. So those are, the, those are, my, those are the overall concepts related to reaction orders and rate. Now in the next video, I'm going to go into how to calculate the, those reaction orders and the rate using the experimental data that I've been referring to.